my title, but I don't like it. It's, we just use it for other people to understand. I think it's a creative producer for the company. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, I guess, artistic director. Um, my name is Elizabeth Mungaray. I'm one of the ensemble members with Death and Luna. My name is Maya Milan Gonzalez, and I am also an ensemble member. Um, and then we can go back to Ariel. She can say hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, Ariel, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, hi. Say hi to everybody. Hey, everybody. Uh, <laughs> my name is Ariel Brown. I am an artistic associate. Fabulous. Thank you. And so why don't we just go ahead right around the circle, and y'all can tell us who you are, if you have an affiliation, let us know, and maybe what city you primarily work in. Cool. So we'll just start right here to our right. Hi, friends. I'm Nick Bailey. Um, the pronouns I use are he, him, his, and I um, am an assistant dean at a college, and my full-time job is to try and find arts engagement opportunities for students in Southern California. Um, but I'm affiliated with the Tom Response Ensemble. Awesome. I want to hear so much more about you guys. You guys have a session later today, right? Yes. Okay. In this room. Or in this yeah, room. right. We'll be here for <laughs> Um, uh, my name is Teresa Ray, and I'm, uh, I teach at the University of Oregon, um, and my work uh, is community-based work on tribal communities and around environmental issues, and um, I'm also an artistic director of something called um, Earth Matters on the Stage. I'm Jennifer Kimball. I'm from Atlanta. I work at the Georgia Institute of Technology. My job is to be a chair. Um, student arts engagement there, which is a whole new world for them, mm -hmm. um, and a whole new world for me. Uh, I have done theater production in and around Atlanta, mostly for over 15 years, and have recently gotten into the university world. Awesome. Thank you. Um, MK Wayman, currently with the National Performance Network, based in New Orleans. Um, I also teach a course in art and community at the, in the arts administration program, master's in arts administration program at the University of New Orleans. Hi everyone, my name is Molly. I am the founding artistic director of a new emerging uh, dance theater company, Great Box Collective, outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I am also an instructor and administrator at Arizona State University. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Carney. I'm based here in Chicago where I, uh, I usually use her and her pronouns. And I direct the Gender and Sexuality Center at the University of Illinois Chicago, just a little bit west of here. I'm also an ensemble member with Rivendell Theater Ensemble on the North Side of Chicago. It's a pro professional women's ensemble focused around um, advancing women through the arts. And you guys have a show that's closing this weekend, right? Yeah. Uh, next week. Next week. Yeah. 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 It's, it's up right now. So. Yes. And I've heard amazing things. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Leonard Madrid. I'm from Albuquerque. I'm part of the artistic court Blackout Theater, and I teach at Central New Mexico College and the University of New Mexico. Um, I'm Isai McKeever. I'm a choreographer with Dance Luna, and yeah, I, I freelance choreographer a lot of people, <laughs> mostly myself these days. <laughs> Yeah. Practice and um, social justice work, yeah? Okay. Um, Ariel, you introduced yourself, but you want to tell us your affiliations? Yes. Um, so I am a master's student in public humanities um, at Brown University, and I am also a fellow with the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Thanks, girl. Um, awesome. Okay, so now we know who we are. Um, we want to tell you a little bit about what we thought we could spend our time together doing, and if there's consensus around that, we'll move forward. But it's going to be very fluid. If you need to leave, leave. If you need to stay, you stay. Um, but I wanted to come join the circle. Join the circle. Grab a chair. Join the circle. Um, you guys, perfect timing. We just finished introducing ourselves and the room. So if you guys want to kind of join in, just tell us your name. Um, what you, if you have any affiliations? Um, with ensembles or other organizations or other institutions, and uh, where you primarily do your work, um, or if there is no primary place you do your work, I'm really interested in that as well. So I think we'll start here with the new additions. Hello. Hello, my name is Melissa Gray, former ensemble member of Dada Luna, current general manager of Three Street Theater. Hello. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, I'm Deja. I'm a Free Street member, Unsung member, and I've been at Free Street for a year now. So awesome! Congratulations! Yeah. I think you're the next new joiner. Oh, me? Okay, sorry. Hi, <laughs> I'm Amy Ann, um, professor at Hampshire College, and most of my work is uh, around the world. I kind of do a lot of work in China and Singapore and other places. Excellent. I'm Leslie Tarabuchi, I teach at CalArts, California School of the Arts, and I'm the producing director for CalArts and Performance, and I'm a net. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So, I'm sorry, oh, yeah. a little bit earlier. Yeah, so that's, oh, so I'm going to repeat it again. If you need to dash out, please don't feel awkward or comfortable. Just go on your way. It's a very good space, and we thank you for joining us for the party. You can join us. Okay, cool. Cool. So, um, can you guys start handing out the word that she told Okay, so I have to say a little bit about what we thought we would do. So, because we could talk for like days and hours about our work, but we really wanted to kind of focus on the intersection between how our work, um, the way in which we work needs to be adapted for the piece at hand. And we didn't, it took us kind of a really long time to identify that within our ensemble. Um, so some background, we basically have about four to five generations of ensembles at that Rosanna, just to give you some context. Um, and at our ninth and ten year mark, we have a huge leadership transition from the founding artistic directors to the current state where there are no founding members currently in the organization. So it's a broad 15 year history, right? Um, and we were founded here in Chicago as an all Latina theater company. And um, currently we find ourselves today at year 15 retaining that title, but as a mission serving and creating safe space for all women of color artists. And that could be a whole panel in itself, how that change came about. Um, it was a very organic process and recognizing, I'll just like bottom line it this way, recognizing the cultural shifts that were happening in this country and just like the straight up mixing of people. And um, it started to become, to feel like an exclusive space if we weren't opened up to the broader contingent of women of color, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and as an intersectional company, right, it's kind of like um, something that was at conflict within ourselves. It took us a long time to kind of figure it out. <laughs> um, anything about that you want to add? Okay, so we kind of want, like I said, we want to focus on the, the this intersection of how form changes based on the project. We want to talk about partnerships, the benefits and the challenges with institutional partnerships unequal partnerships, partnerships with organizations the same size, and just individual artistic partnerships. And then thirdly, what was our third point that I wanted to take away from this? The third point is how. Oh yes, so how a, an artistic project, and in this case we're gonna talk about Generation Sex, how an artistic project can be only one part of how you change from local ensemble to national ensemble. And it's through this project, through the lens of an artistic project that the scope of our organization has changed, right? Um, and then I just want to share with you the takeaways that I hope you guys leave this space with, maybe some tools around these issues. One is adaptability. So we want to hopefully talk about how you can change a challenge into an opportunity, which I feel like is the life story and lifeblood of this company. We should have shut down probably 20 times in 15 year history. 15 year history. And so how do you, when you're coming up against that moment of do you close and move on to something else, how do you give rebirth to something? The second takeaway we really want to talk about is a really scary word. People are really scared of the word failure. And we are on a mission to re-empower particularly women of color around the notion of failure. It can actually be a powerful thing. How can the most learn, the best learning can happen there? And we want to draw a kind of a, um, a line between ensemble as one of the last frontiers in the American theater as a safe space for artistic failure. And how can we actually promote that as something positive? Um, and then the third takeaway we'd like you guys to think about is how can you build work based on who's in the room? Not who you thought was in the room, not who you invited to be in the room, not who you thought you should have had in the room, but actually taking stock of who's in the room. And that has taken us 15 years to figure out as we've gone through four different ensembles and started to work with people outside of the company. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to y'all what we talked about? Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense as our focus here today? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I hope we get to the peer sharing. I think we're a small enough group that we can do it. Um, but we're gonna start with looking at Gen Sex, how we built this project, 
and how it informed the other processes that I talked about. And then we'll move forward to a, just an open conversation. Hopefully that'll bring up questions and we can kind of go from there. Sound like a plan? Yeah. <laughs> all right, awesome. So, are we all? I'm gonna throw it over to you um, to kind of talk about your relationship and how you came into this process. Cool. Um, so I began working with Teatro Luna uh, in the fall of 2014. I worked with them um, as a Mellon Artistic Leadership Fellow through the Montreal at the Los Angeles Theater Center. Um, and so I began working with them and kind of thinking through their, um, listening to their process of how they created ensemble, how they had this kind of um, uh, fluid space uh, for women of color to come in and develop work with them. And um, I, I began to hear about gender and sex, the lineage of which you'll hear a little bit more about later. Um, and I got really excited about that project. And so I came on as an artistic associate. Um, I worked as a creative producer with them and also as an advisor in the room, um, a writer um, as well. And so that process began in January and February of 2015. Um, and we he had a moment where we had the opportunity to go to El Teatro Campesino and think about um, what the next kind of ensemble iteration of Teatro Luna might look like. Um, and, and in that moment, we were really thinking through um, how does Teatro Luna become a home space for women of color artists? Um, uh, I think in this kind of contemporary moment that we're in, looking at gentrification and um, displacement of people, uh, but also looking at um, um, how transient we all are. Um, this kind of need for ensemble to not be um, exclusively rooted to one space, but um, but to kind of make a, a transient home was something that was coming to the forefront for us. And, um, and, and so, so our work on um, generation sex at the LATC was kind of a foray into what it might look like to develop a national ensemble, um, what it might look like to um, develop a home space that was for transient and local um, artists of color, women of artists of color. Um, and so, so that's kind of the, um, the foundation of what that process was. Um, as an artist coming into this process, working with um, Teatro, Luna, Teatro Luna as an ensemble, um, I felt very empowered to um, come into the room as a writer um, and to have the, the human resources of the wealth of people um, that um, Alex brought into the room, the wealth of, um, the wealth of kind of um, just talents and gifts and, um, and technologies and um, knowledges that people brought into the room and how that really informed um, the piece and how it developed and shifted over time. Um, I wrote um, three pieces within that work um, that I that I think um, the process and the transiency of the Teatro Luna Ensemble um, really kind of undergirded my ability to grow as an artist in that process. And I think that that's just a testament to the capacities of, um, of this, this transient model of ensemble. Um, feel free to pipe in as the conversation goes, and when, if you need to jet, you know, you know the deal, just jet. Cool? Um, also, does anybody have any immediate questions about what Ariel just talked about before I post them there? Not even happen here. Is there anything that popped up? All right, so I just want to give a little context. Um, I really wanted Ariel to speak to this because she came into the development process of a project at the two-year mark. So, um, do you guys want to share a little bit of the history of the project and how it developed over the course of two years? Yeah, so um, um, some of us here do know a little bit of that. But it, Generation Sex first started as a revamp of a show, Gatuna Capitano, which is SCXO. So we were revisiting that, and how now that 10 years have passed since that show 
came about, how our lives really aren't the same after that, with technology we're coming in. And so we wanted to really, we got that show, we just that we have our own stories. We have the own people in the room have things to add on to that, that include technology, or that include different things as time changes. So um, when we discovered that, we did a workshop at it, it's Los Advantes, and it was a group of 10 or 12 women who came in. Melissa, the workshop. Melissa was a part of it as well. And then after that, we did a workshop and like, hey, there's still more to do, as a lot of work always is. It never dies, right? It always keeps changing. And then after, we had, which we'll see them later, um, we had Luna on tour. So a group of us, three, Maya and Alex, went on an uh, international tour, which is really <laughs> awesome, international tour. And so they were working on getting stories from different people all over the world about gender. We like, I said, really, really good. So we went on tour with a different project. Yeah. And we recognized, so a challenge was how does some, a group our size develop multiple projects at the same time? So that was a, like a challenge we were having in 10 years. Like we were never developing more than one device piece. We could do a device piece and then you play by a playwright. You could never do two device projects at the same time. And so we really felt, okay, this is an opportunity. Several of us are going on an international tour. We're going to be together for three and a half months. <laughs> and then there's a contingent at home about of another amazing 12 talented people and just because we're gone doesn't mean they shouldn't be working. So we said, okay, we're going to develop in the multiple cities we're going to be at. We're going to have interviews. We're going to do workshops. Y'all are going to do workshops and then you're going to direct something at the sh Chicago Fringe Festival when we come, which is, and we got to see the closing performance of that when we came home for international tours. Yeah, which was great because it was a totally different take with the artists that were here. So the lead artists that were here, which Melissa was part of as well, like it was a completely different take on generation sex. Mm -hmm. And what does that hand have to do with what ultimately will culminate to this show that was over here and with the stories that they brought in? And so after that, we realized, like, wow, that's amazing. Let's, what can we take from that? And then after, we started to do a work, another workshop in Chicago. With a whole new set of actors. With a whole new set of actors. So I think the only, there was, I was in, I think I was the only one that stayed with yeah. that show. So it was in all, I think I believe I was in all iterations of Generation yeah. Sex. Yeah, okay, well. Besides wow. the international tour. Besides the international tour one, which was the Just other project. Yeah. So from there, uh, we started to go a whole new bunch of actors. And then we brought in visual artists. We brought in, we brought in a choreographer, we brought in Isai. And how does that change and inform our work? And how does that building on like who was the gifts that were in the room, as we all do, like we have to parallel that. We have to parallel the trends that are happening in our society. Um, so we built a workshop of that in Chicago, and I'm like touching really briefly. And one week right before we opened that workshop in Chicago, Elliot Rodgers. It's a year mark. Uh, it's a year mark of development. It's uh, a year mark of development process. One week before, something happens that completely changed the show for us. Was that Elliot Rodgers shot? I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. So we're like, wow, yes. That one week before we said, do we talk about these mur the justification of the murders of women and men because he didn't find love? We didn't find and our show is called about love, generation sex, it's about loneliness. And how does that inform? How do we change all of that within a week before the show? So we built that. And um, after, we realized, well, we're here in Chicago, we, there's more to be done with this show. But a lot of times, one of the challenges that we face is that when people come to see a workshop, they think that's a finished product. And as we all know, it never is a finished product, right? So we decided to test, and there's We're more. starting to have issues with people coming, coming to a workshop, maybe coming to a second workshop a year later, and then not bothering to come to the final world premiere, thinking they've already experienced this project. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we were trying, we, we tried a bunch of methods to get people to understand, like, so we started certain hashtags so people could watch the process of the show, and we started things like inviting live tweeters and live bloggers to the process to try to share that it's a process, because it's very challenging to communicate to an audience, and we have a, a at that point, a 15 year old audience, a 12 year old audience, and it's still a challenge mm -hmm. to communicate. So they're tracking up to this, oh, so like, we are generation sex, like yesterday we were looking it up, it's like, wow, this is how we track our work virtually, right, as well. So we decided to go on tour. We decided to develop the next phase on tour. Mm -hmm. So we partnered with six different universities. Um, one in, I wish I had the new play map up. 
But basically, we went to Texas, we went to Louisiana, Louisiana we went to Connecticut, Connecticut and two schools. Two, schools in, two schools in each. And so we created a methodology where we rehearsed before we left on tour some version of the show, some mediocre okay. version of the show, right? <laughs> and the idea was <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. um, It's okay, but we were trying things, right? And so the idea, because we, so this is important. We've been a touring company to universities for our whole history, right? Right. So we are, yeah, it's our bread and butter. That's how our actors get paid, like, and that can even be a challenge sometimes. Um, so we'd already had this method of taking work that was finished out to the university once it's in our repertoire. But we were like, okay, we don't have cash. We have this challenge of audiences being kind of played out with a title. What's a solution? And we looked internally and we were like, we already have a solution. It's on the road. Flip the order. Go on tour for a development cycle with these institutional partners instead of only doing it in the aftermath to share ready work. And what excited our partners, what got them to give us more money, we got paid more money for the development tour than when a tour is finished. Because the angle, it's, it, it's a genuine angle. Your students get to be part of the show. Your students will change the fabric of our show. So the model we created is we would perform one night, do really intensive audience feedbacks, go home, think about everything, throw half of it out the window, right. and the next morning, sometimes we would get the uh, workshop with the students on how to build a device work. So we would do that through the process. We'd use the work they saw last night. They tell us what they hated. They tell us what they liked. And we would play and do a whole new show for that audience plus new people that night. Mm. And then we'd leave, go to the next town, and do the exact same process. Mm. So it was solving two challenges for us, a cash issue, uh, audience tired issue, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say that. And third, it is expanding our national network. And that, if you build a good relationship with the person you go, they're going to want you to come back. And we already knew that we need to figure out through technology how to deepen that relationship we were forming in these one or two nights. Because for me, it was like, this is a bad business model that we're just visiting people, sharing, getting intimate, and we don't talk to them anymore because we're so bad about keeping our online world posted, and we're supposed to be like this new wave techie company. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'd like to interject is that um, particularly what this did is it expanded our voice nationally. So it's not just a group of women in Chicago telling their story. It's stories that we've gathered across the country. And particularly when we were on tour for Luna and Lace, through these workshops, the international tour, through these workshops, we would then send things back to the folks in Chicago. The folks in Chicago would send us things that they were working on and would say, okay, well, we're going to try this in tonight's show. And, you know, we learn a monologue really quick that someone just wrote up and then have that dialogue. So it really does expand the local national experience. Absolutely. So, so we're going to fast forward because we could go for hours on like the process. Can I so, ask you a question? yeah, please. So, so say you're in Ohio yeah. and you do a workshop, you yeah. get some new stuff, and I just want to understand, see if I'm understanding this. So, you get a monologue that you think is really juicy and good, and you want to keep it in the show. Do you keep it in the show as you go forward? You're in Virginia, and then you're using a student from Ohio's piece yeah. in the show. So, you're you're getting um, you know, some kind of approval or agreement from mm -hmm. everyone. But they're like, now they're in your show, and that's kind of the deal. Yeah, yeah. so let me clarify two things. It's a really great thing. So um, anytime we do a workshop, there's always, we'll go through the, the release of, uh -huh. uh, if you're writing, you'll release it, and yeah. you still have ability to use it on your own independently, but the company also retains that right. Um, and so definitely consent was super important. I'm that sure. Process, right? yeah. 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 Um, and in other, uh, I would say, um, Less than fully that students were contributing, I would say it was images, phrases, yeah. a movement section. Yeah. And so, yeah. And what was amazing is sometimes a piece, so a, a real clear example, um, <coughs> Diva Cup. So, so yeah. we had a piece called Diva Cup, and basically the idea of the piece was talking about like some being ashamed of, of normal bodily functions. But at some point, there was language that equated womanhood to having a period. As the only, and obviously we all know now there's a child like that's not all women get their not all women get their periods when you're starting to talk about expanded identities like and so we it was amazing the student changed their life so here we are this progressive feminist organization making that kind of flawed thinking in a piece and the student blew it exploded and that piece was never the same again so yeah they have 
that change has lasted two years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. So, development, 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 development. I think another key piece to note here is this is the one project in our history that has never received a single penny from grants. No foundation support. I want to like, I think that's like so important to, to yes. highlight. <laughs> so there is a power. When you own your own work, you can monetize your own work, right? And that, that's the idea. So um, we developed, we did a, 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 so now we're at the one and a half year mark, we came back home, we did a workshop production at Institute of Social Practice where we started the whole thing. And I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is garbage. That's true. There's something here that this is garbage. Where did we go wrong? So then what happened? At the Institute of Social At that workshop. So this is my, it comes back into the process because we get accepted to the Fool's Fury factory model. Right. Work. So then what happens is, again, this goes back to like looking at who is in the room, right? The work is always going to change. So my voice came back into it, right? I was there on tour, and then I stepped out, and I came back. And we also minimized the number of people because we were like, okay, we're going on this, you know, we're going to this festival, so we can't have a group of eight. We're going to just do it in group four. So we really looked at the pieces, and we said, this is the outline of what the show was, right? This is the frame. We're not remounting the show because you can't do that when the voices change, when, when the, the bodies change, when the bodies change, the colorism, right? when the identities change, right? Like I'm a certain body type, and when I'm showing myself out there, that says a story, right? So we acknowledge the stories that our bodies show us. Um, so really, you know, we started with the framework, right? We started looking at it and reading through things together. And then that's when voices kind of say, well, if I'm doing this part now, I wonder what it would be like if it was like this. Or what if we did that instead? Or what about the order of this? Because I feel like with us four people telling this story, when we do A, B, C, it doesn't work as well. Maybe for us, it's more of a C, A, B kind of story that we're going to tell. Yeah, absolutely. And so things like an opening becomes a closing. Mm -hmm. um, something that was talking about fat phobia has to be translated into a racial conversation because of who's in the room. And so, so it's like constant sh negotiation between those kinds of intersectional politics. Mm -hmm. Super draining, super exciting, right? And having to acknowledge <coughs> when to let go, right? There, there was pieces that we all loved, but it just didn't work in this new context. And we had to sit there and go, do we cut this model up? Does this not make sense to this story that we're telling in this And book? every incarnation of a workshop production had a completely different um, transition formula. So that's also really key, because these are episodic kind of pieces. OK, so flash forward. We finish the tour in, in San Francisco. And we get offered the opportunity to co-produce the production at the LATC in a year, a year from that point of that agreement. So we were working with the LATC for that year at the Encuentro, it's how we met Ariel. So we think we know what the play is. We think the play is gonna, it's funny, it's body, and it's about the relationship, the contemporary relationship between technology, sex, and love. And you can't talk about technology, sex, and love and not talk about loneliness. So that was what the play was. We knew it was that, we thought it was funny, we had, we rewrote our description, we pitched it, we're like, Yigal, this is gonna be a sellout show, it's gonna be so fun. Flash forward a year later, we begin the development process in January with Ariel, a whole new group of actors. The only two that had been part of the process was Abigail and Elizabeth. We find ourselves in LA, four ladies. We can hear you. <laughs> 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 Crazy. So we had gone from being in total control of our product because we're using institutional relationships like universities to now having to be in an artistic environment with a co-producer who has an artistic opinion. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's a shift, right? That's a big shift. And here we are. We've collected stories from all across the world. But LA's different. The women of color in LA have different challenges. They have their own unique voice. How do we make something speak to them? So we had 
wait eight weeks until we open. <laughs> we had a script, we had orders. In our house, our method is like a whole wall of sticky notes with every piece, because as you can imagine, in the course of two years, we had 45 women of color writers contributing to the project. That includes students who like pieces made it, so it's about 45 writing contributors. We've had a choreographer, we've had an installation artist, Maya McCrandlewell, helping us. And so many people are touching this thing, right? And probably over 25 actors have also touched it. So we get there and we think we know what this show's about and we write this really funny description and the postcard's sexy. And over the course of eight weeks, Ariel, the process of partnership and its challenges changed the very fabric of the show. It became angrier. It became darker. And, <laughs> yeah, would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> and it became a little blacker in a really great way because we had more black actresses join the ensemble. Uh, I want to point out something. Yeah. I think Theater uh, Limit is known as an all of the engineering company. We, all of our work has definitely like, identified race as a factor, right? it's and it's ethnicity. Yeah. ethnicity in it. But Generation Sex was really the first show where we don't talk explicitly about race. We don't explicitly talk about our ethnicity. It is about women about all that and when we come to LA it is all, it was like split 50 50 our cast and our crew mm -hmm. was all women of color of not that you know wasn't the majority mm -hmm. and that I think is very it was a shift a size of shift in how our company is running. Yeah. yeah exactly so as we're going through the process of developing the show and the show is changing the project we set out to do, which is create a national ensemble with multiple sites, so we were at, at this whole time we're trying to open that through Luna in Los Angeles, Ariel joins us and explodes the entire notion. She goes, why are you trying to open up another site with its own ensemble when what you're telling me you want to accomplish is a system in which a woman, an actress in LA, can come to Chicago and audition and be involved in projects in Chicago and have the support of Luna, maybe housing, maybe gigs. That's, if you're trying to actually create a safe space, a safe network across the country, and then you want to open up in New York in 2018, how can this project serve that end goal in thinking about ensemble is not, so we weren't creating an LA ensemble, which is what we originally thought. We were creating a national ensemble. What does that mean? Because ensemble, to me, as I've understood it, is who's in the room? Who are you touching? Who are you exchanging with? Who are you breathing with? Who are you, you know what I mean? So that exploded the very understanding of what we had of what ensemble meant. Ensemble was sisterhood, ensemble was friendships, ensemble was going through abortions, miscarriages, marriages, divorces. That personal aspect, how do you manage that and tell a commute? Mm -hmm. We haven't figured it out. <laughs> and we figured it out to the level that, that, that we can have. I, I, this is my life. It is constant FaceTime with people. It's constant phone calls, right? So we haven't perfected it yet, right? But Ariel went to grad school and is still here. And that is true with so many people. So, so the, 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 I think the real truth of this all, the project became this beautiful artistic tapestry. And it was our first financial, complete financial failure in 15 years mm -hmm. in terms of selling in LA. Mm -hmm. And it took until one month ago we, we closed that show April 20, what, May? No, May, May 2015. 15. We have not produced a single performance since then. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a total like, oh, they're gone, they're done. Failure, bye. No, it took us a year to start archiving the entire process. Just go back, because we archive everything through hashtags. And I wish we had time to kind of go through all that, but it has taken us a year. It took us nine months to realize the show's not over. It actually was only part two of a trilogy. <laughs> so next year, what you're going to see from that, <laughs> we're going to bring back the original SCXO. We're going to do the newest version that we haven't built yet of We Are Generation of Generation Sex, mm. and the third trilogy called Love Sick. And they're going to run in rep. And it's going to be ridiculous. <laughs> but sometimes you have to go on a very crazy journey to land there. So. We're also, we've opened LA, we put so much energy, we're doing so well, recruiting new people, getting a national reputation, and Chicago implodes. Nothing is happening. We have ensemble members over the course of those two years dropping like flies. What happened? 
Mm. The very thing we were built on, a safe space for Latina and women of color artists, that entire notion was mythologized, pathologized, to the point where the space became destructive because it was trying to do too much. It was everywhere, trying to do everything. It was hungry, it was thirsty. Honey badger syndrome. Honey badger syndrome, right? We pushed people to the limit because there was a period of time we were operating a space here, a two theater venue. We were touring every week to a different university and we were producing maybe five nights a week at that show and doing rentals. How can you sustain that and be developing several shows? For a company of our size, less than $350,000, and no foundation support, we challenge, right? So we share that with you guys. We're really proud of that history. We're really proud of that failure because something so much bigger has been born out of it, a desire to continue this experiment of national ensemble. And we're well on our way. We've done so many amazing parts of this, but now we've got to figure out how to all make it work in synchronicity and how to like rebuild the idealized version of a safe space. How do you do that? How do you mutate? How do you, you know? So, so that's kind of what we want to talk about. The rest I want to hear from you guys. What questions do you have about that? Please reach out to Ariel as well. And then I want to go through this little worksheet. So let's start with questions, yeah. Um, I'm glad that you talked about um, the mythology of the ensemble and something that we discussed yesterday in a different workshop was the, uh, the trajectory of building and creating safe space for ensemble work, not particularly when you do social justice, particularly when you do narratives that are built on personal trauma or personal experience, whether they be autobiographic or ethnographic. So part, part of things that I'm experiencing have experienced in that Luna, and I also think that you should point out the piece that you wrote around trauma, what happens within ensembles personally. We all have it. There is all drama at some point. Yeah. Personal relationships intercede the work. Personal, um, uh, well, the way the dynamics can control the room sometimes mm -hmm. is a real thing. Um, so I think that that's important, and what I am uh, struggling with right now as an ensemble member in another theater company, and also general manager of my own, is like, that ensemble word, <laughs> it's kind of like a word in diversity where like, we think it means something else, but it's really the act of, yeah. Yeah. right? Coming, coming from the grassroots, from the bottom level. Um, it's really, it's really something different, and I, I honestly feel like we can try to do the work ahead, but if we're not whole, like, just as people, if we don't have self-care, we can't really do work. Ensemble has to operate from a self-care self space, and I, and I think, I just want to, I just want to, um, ask you to speak a little bit on the piece that you wrote, um, to call out the real problems of ensemble dynamic and, um, how, use our example of how we yeah. come through a lot of that stuff yeah. and still have trauma within the ensemble because you can't work. You can't work. And, it, and it's not going to be real. I mean, you, you could put on productions, 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 but I feel like there's a true sense of hurt that comes from the production itself and the ensemble within when when you don't try. And, and that Luna, and from my experience, is a perfect example of having shed skin four or five times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much involved in that, right? So yeah, we did write a piece last year. I actually we didn't do it in here. We've done a lot in here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Forming, which is crazy for us, right? Because that's the healing. The healing is the building together. Yeah. So uh, we wrote a piece that's in Hespos. Um, I can like make it accessible. We're gonna make it more accessible to people who don't like subscribe to that journal. So basically, the piece was a 15. It was our 15 year anniversary. Still is until June, and it was a retrospective on trying to be very honest about, you know, when you're already outside of the mainstream of what people accept as theater, and I think we always talk about ensemble through really rose-colored lenses. We're a family. We do social justice work. We're engaged in the community. Those are beautiful, powerful words, but there's words and then there's actions, right? And so, so we really struggled a lot with, what do you do when you can't pay people? What do you do when leadership moving up looks one way when you're saying you're a, a body of artists of color? 
how, right, how does class of a group of people and the different classes in the room, how do microaggressions within a social justice space impact your heart? Like, so it was all, I mean, the article is all about that and all about like real mistakes we make. Tr because we're engaging in something we're trying to call hashtag project fail. <laughs> I want nonprofits, and particularly my interest is women of color and artists to talk about the failures because what happens is the youth coming up they don't hear about them. So when right. they experience that trauma for the first time, they think they are alone. Yeah, they are the only people yeah. that it's happened to. Right. Um, because I mean, like, in my experience of uh, being part of an ensemble this past four years, uh, whether it was at a um, uh, theater ensemble for one year, and then I switched over to uh, Free Street Theater, uh -huh. and I've been there for three years now. Uh, in my experience, I feel like I've always been part of this ensemble, and I've grown with the ensemble, and I've healed with the ensemble. And as more new people come to it, um, like I don't, I know this year um, there were some people that left. There's always the seniors leaving, yep. mm -hmm. um, but um, now that now that I'm a senior, I realize the role that we all play in, a, in an ensemble. Um, for me, that role would be I, I would consider myself a leader. I've learned how to lead. I've learned how to become this person that not only in the ensemble, but in the working space, the safe space, but outside, people can still refer to me as, uh, people can look at me the same way that they do in an ensemble. Um, I, I like, oh, wait, is that, what, oh, I'm getting lost. It's okay, um, it's okay. So, I was getting to the fact that um, being in an ensemble, I don't know, I, I find myself very like, um, just um, wrapped around the work that we're doing, and I don't like. I don't. Cat. I don't have moments where I question: Will there be ever? Will there be ever failure or anything? So I like hearing this. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like hearing this because it prepares me <coughs> for the future. Yes. Yeah. And it's it's about discovering that work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, While you're putting up with each other. <laughs> projects you have at hand are the artistic projects and what we have found is really healthy is to when you're making your like calendar of your season or however you get your work the project of just ensemble building mm -hmm. is a project mm -hmm. just like your administration mm -hmm. is a year-round project do you have anything to add to that yes or truths yeah no 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 <laughs> that is degree you, you have to be intentional about the time that you're spending and what we did is we just went all art. We were like, we're just gonna make, and we stopped thinking about process mm -hmm. and organizational infrastructure and because we're just selling and doing and making, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there, uh, when you said you're, that you've been touring a lot, um, yeah. that you have been, yeah. you're going every weekend to the university, yeah. and, that, and I don't know, I sort of follow you guys on Instagram, so I see you've been <laughs> not just in Chicago, but you've been all over the country in the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah. Have, I've done a lot of this too. I'm just curious. Has touring exacerbated what we're talking about right now? Like drama, yeah. amongst and ensemble. Oh, well, maybe I'll talk about it. <laughs> you come up with ways. Of <laughs> I mean, you know, I think that's where you really have to look at. Here's the thing, right? When I came together and I worked with a couple other ensembles, there's. You were just on tour, right? I literally, I just came on tour. I just jumped <laughs> in the party for a three month tour. <laughs> about that for Luna that was very unique is something very simple actually is we start every meeting with a check-in mm -hmm. and that kind of goes to what we're saying about who is in the room not who you'd like to be in the room or who you thought was in the room but <clears throat> who are you in this moment mm -hmm. and that's what today's rehearsal is accepting and embracing not who we thought you were when we brought you in and who we expect you to be yeah. but who you are in that day and so, on tour, right, we're creating these things, and then we're going back to our hotel, and we're all like right there. <laughs> so it's really intensive work together, and you have to look at some people, and some people, that is not the space, the environment, that they emotionally thrive in, which then affects the work, right? And so then, 
things come embracing failure? I would say m most people that have left the company on, on more negative terms, it, I can point it back to we brought them on tour and they were better served by performances local. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I no longer tour, I no longer cast my tours based on the best person for a role. Mm -hmm. I cast based on personality and uh, you have to want to be on the road. You have to want it, mm -hmm. um, particularly on three month tours. Mm -hmm. If you are gonna cry because you're not talking to your partner three times a day, that is really detrimental to like the holistic, healthy space that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. So the first 10 years, it was easier. It was one-off touring to a college and university. The second we added in self-produced tours to the mix, it's a very different story. You're not dealing with a $5,000 check in advance and you're paying people on time. Money always comes into the equation, always. So it's about personality. And are you a fit to the tour? And it's not, it's not, I don't think the people who can't tour are any less valuable. They're amazing to have in the room. But a lot of those mistakes were my own leadership mistakes. It's just not having that understanding or that knowledge in my 20s. I do now, right? And I would, I, it's amazing. You can't problem solve mistakes of the past, but you can learn and take them to the future, right? And so that is a huge thing is like, do these people even work together in a room? Well, there's, there's also the question of like, did it exacerbate the process of, of when we were touring, what else was happening? Yes. Um, you know, having ensemble is huge because when half of your ensemble leaves, and it's probably the more productive half, <laughs> what, what happens to ensemble that's there? So like, we, we, we attribute a lot of our work to ensemble, but when you separate, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, part of the thing that we were talking about is like in one of the projects with the Chicago Fringe, I was put in a role as a producer, but I never had the opportunity to learn how to produce. Mm -hmm. So it was like, how do we mentor, <coughs> us, like, mentor each other on an individual basis? Mm -hmm. um, how, how, do, how do we hold strong as individual artists and learn skills from each other as an ensemble so that when, when the ensemble changes shape, loses form, that ensemble still exists in forms of strong individual people. Yeah. Um, and so I think yeah. that that's where one, one particular instance where touring exacerbated the process of ensemble, mm -hmm. because then, you know, what, what do we do in the ensemble? Well, that's where the space becomes unsafe, because something that was supposed to be an opportunity for you mm -hmm. became a very painful experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it just, just in the like, oh, that was different. I didn't know how to produce. Yeah. Or like, we didn't know how to, do one thing at home and one thing at the other because we were so used to ensemble moving together as one. Mm -hmm. And we were touring for several years because we had no home. But now that we had a home, how do we And she needs physical theater space. Yeah. Right. And that comes to, I think that's close to another great point of like how as artists do we give ourselves a license to be able to work administratively? Because if we cannot work administratively, we cannot do the artistic part. Mm -hmm. And how do we fill ourselves with that knowledge? Which is something when we did LA, something I definitely learned um, was how to, by working administratively, how do we empower our artists? Mm -hmm. And with that, that was definitely like well, there's an action there's like accessibility yeah. with that too. Like we, we don't always have access to the same information mm -hmm. at an institutional level or at a grassroots yeah. level. There's clear barriers of how to do it. You could do three panels on that alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, oh yeah, I'm just gonna sort of chime in on this. I mean, I love what you're saying about how can ensemble create opportunities for professional development or yeah. growth into new areas, mm -hmm. you know. But the comments are also making me think about what are the expectations we have on each other yes. as ensemble members, you know? And I think sometimes there are unspoken or unarticulated expectations that we hold mm -hmm. in the room. And um, if I think about another model of organizing, like coalition building, yes. you know, like social justice yes. work, if we're building coalitions, we might invite people into the space differently, knowing that they can participate in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Not better, not worse, differently. Mm -hmm. yes. That people are gonna bring different assets and challenges and opportunities into the room. So, um, but I think sometimes in the ensemble member, we, because we use family, right? Yeah. Like that, these like idealized, these yeah. idealized yeah. notions of family even, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Of like, oh, we're, oh, we have this common bond, but if, you know, if we think about that model as, well, we have these people who are bringing these particular strengths, can tour, can't tour, can hold down the fort when we're at tour, whatever, want to expand into administrative and think about it in that more layered way, we kind of set ourselves up 
for a healthier space. Yes. Because we're not expecting everyone to be able to show up at the same time because they've got a job or kids or perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, but we're taking all of those things into consideration. Like, yes, how yeah. hitting the nail on the head. It's about expectations and managing. I have had to eradicate the notion of obligation. My ensemble members, they are not serving. It's hard. It's like the chicken or the egg. Are the individuals serving the ensemble or is the ensemble serving them? And it has to be this constant two-way system. Mm -hmm. And um, so for us, something that helped us move in that direction of uh, building health in terms of expectations, we stopped seeing the Aparuna as the Aparuna. And how is anybody who ever passes through our doors the Aparuna when they come and when they go? And we translated that into a online platform through RL's, RL's genius idea. She was like, if anybody who comes through your doors is Luna forever, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, right? Because they can choose to acknowledge it or not. How do we give them a mechanism when they're traveling, when they're maybe on in a whole other ensemble on tour, but maybe they want to use, so hashtag Luna in the link has become a mechanism where people can in their own work, still be carrying forth some of these values and representing and embodying a spirit, the idealized spirit of what Luna should be in their work, right? And what does that do? It creates a, an archival map. We don't have to do any work to archive the countless people who come into the institution now, right? Or, and come and go. Does that kind of make sense? <laughs> this is kind still so natural. And it doesn't. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> any questions or thoughts about Anything that's come up. Sorry, I, I, maybe it's time to move on, but I just have a quick follow-up yeah. to it. Um, I just so I'm obviously curious because so like this year I'm touring with uh, two different shows all the time, and we and we all often have different but similar groups of people in the room, right? Yeah. And and I'm curious to know you talked about a check-in. So I think what my challenge has been is. I, I even said it out loud, and I'm still sort of working towards a practical answer, but it's like, every time that my company comes in the room, my theater unspeakable, every time we're in the room, it's got to feel like it's a theater unspeakable room. Right. You know, I think, which I think, because you were kind of talking about um, ensemble is, I can touch it, it's contact, it's yeah. people that I'm with right now that I'm working with. But some people will go on, some people won't, some people will find different ways to interact with the company in different Different, you know, some people will come to the five-year party because yeah. they were part of the first year, and that's right. great, right? And that's yeah. I think that's that that brings a lot of uh, un, you know, like it's like it's not it's not like a transaction, but it, it's like wow, the person who's acting at the company today in year five, seeing someone from year one, is there, there's a, there's something that's sort of just magical about that. That mm -hmm. it's it's not quantifiable. Mm -hmm. it's, what is it, MasterCard is priceless. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, it's that, it's that other thing, right? Um, but so facilitating that, I think the job has become, as the manager of it, the leader of it, to say, what is it that people are coming for and how do I make sure that every room, whether, yeah, whether it's coalition building and everyone always feels like we're all, like, I want to go to a pro whatever meeting or I always want to go to a Dr. Lumen rehearsal or meeting, I was, I, do, have you guys work towards check-in is like a great idea yeah. is it is it like the piece we saw last night like I always know there's going to be a rainbow circle at the beginning you know are there, are there, are there any are there any particular yeah. mm -hmm. insights that I'd love to hear you know how do you always make it feel like a theater room in the room even if it's a FaceTime conversation yeah, yeah for sure um, again this is not foolproof this is just things that we have found that have worked for us and unfortunately it didn't happen in the space today. One is the greeting. Like no one enters at that point of space but a hug, a kiss, a hello, how are you, whether we're strangers or not. So that is like number one. There's always music and almost always food. <laughs> I forgot that oh so like, yeah. it is really hard for us to have an event, whether it's a meeting, whether it's a public event, coffee and food, it has been, it's just part of the brand, right? And music and ritual is a huge part of it. So internally, our process of checking is important. If it's a group with new people in the room, there's always some sort of game. Is it a secret telling game? Is it a physical exercise? Some kind of sharing that takes you to a vulnerable space, not a dangerous space, but a vulnerable space, is how we start everything, from a workshop in a university to a partnership with another ensemble. Am I missing anything? No. No, I mean, I think it really, it goes down to the space 
is a safe space and it's an honest space, right? So no matter what's happening, I think that's where the vulnerability really comes in, right? If we do, we'll do a spectrum exercise. What do you guys think about this? Where are you on the spectrum, right? And it's being open and honest to then be able to create. Do you want to add something? All right. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I want to also say that um, I think before I even really got deep into working with Luna that, um, that there's kind of this, um, this um, sense among folks who are not even artistic associates or ensemble members um, with Luna that, um, that Luna's follow-up and reach is continuous. Um, so that there's always this, um, there's always a sense of welcome, there's always the sense of the door is open. Um, and I think that that is, um, yeah, how is it, how, how then do you think about, yeah, ensemble as a me, but like how can it kind of take the shape of, um, of, of the communities that it's, it's currently local to, and, um, and how can it just stay in touch, you know? Um, I think that that's pretty consistent. I think that's great. Um, one thing that is a tradition held over from the founding artistic directors, so uh, as a director, and my aesthetic is a lot more visual, thank you, Megan, it's a lot more visual and, and all these things, so like I have a personal trademark and so does my ensemble, but one thing that we have carried over from what I call classic Luna, um, even more important than the food and the coffee, is a writing prompt. Mm -hmm. That is how we completely enter a space, particularly with strangers. Because at the end of the day, if, like we had a tagline, Teatro Luna Blank tagline, not you know who we are, it would be your story matters, period. And so that is what we do: tell people that their story matters and teach them different ways to like tell it, right? Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we go through this little workshop here, coaching thing? Yeah. Just briefly, I I love hearing your, the structures that we put in place to maintain and continue to create this dynamic space. So on the other end of yeah. when people leave the family, yeah. as happens with families, yeah. there's there's cleavage, there's people left bereft. Yeah. Um, are there some structures on the other end uh, that you deal with, whether the departures have to do with careers or you know or or you know biological family issues mm -hmm. or or, uh, or trauma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're definitely in the part of the process of right now just starting to deconstruct for us in a theoretical way, kind of, what are the different categories that the trauma is occurring in so that we can find solutions that are unique to that, right? Because there's a very big difference with how I will deal with somebody who departs because of a personal life issue than who departs because they feel that they haven't been valued their pay has been late way too many times, a trust has eroded, right? There's a very different thing. The unhealthy way we're dealing with it right now is, a, is landing on me, personally, Alex Neva, to invest a lot of time, like, well, I'll just, let's just take the Melissa example. So with Melissa, I think I had to meet and just extend myself to Melissa four or five times for us to be back on a speaking place. So Melissa and I, had to fix something between us as individuals for me to even then find a way for Melissa to heal her traumas with the, com the organization. That is not, a, right? Because there's the people, there's the personal traumas, but then you're also left with like a trauma with an entity that yeah. is a thought concept. Yeah. Yeah. The, the mythological being of what um, yeah. it was. Yeah. <laughs> so right now, the first step that we've identified in terms of the public scope of that is starting to write about it. Mm -hmm. So the piece last year was the first step to acknowledging, let's just publicly state, that the Luna is not perfect, that the Luna has majorly messed up in these ways and this is what we've learned from it. That was step one. Step two is working with several facilitators to help us devise a restored how do you say the word? Restorative, restorative justice circle. So it's our, we're about to finish our 15 year. We're in the process of bringing everybody who's ever been Luna to a summit. Mm -hmm. That'll launch the process. But it will take years. It will take years. So now it's one of my questions. I've never worked with a facilitator or mediator. Yeah. And we work with many and we train as facilitators. So my lead artist, 
eventually become very highly trained in facilitation of large group work, right? Um, that's a whole skill set in and of itself, right? Because you're dealing with your own traumas, your own ensemble, but also how we make money is go out and workshop and teach people a method, and that requires a whole different kind of facilitation kind of technique. Um, how do you, if you're going like um, on tour like every other week, how do you get these people to open up to you to like tell these stories if you're like moving kind of quickly? Yeah, yeah. You would, the power of your own personal story mm -hmm. is magic. I like to say, people say like, in 30 seconds, you'll know some, who somebody is, <laughs> right? Like, you can just get a feeling. That like, that is in, entirely, like, that, that process is even shortened when you're telling your own story. Mm -hmm. And so we model the openness. We do not walk into a room and expect you to suddenly bury your soul to <coughs> us in this false hierarchy because we're teachers. We, like, we walk into every space saying, we don't know shit. All we have is our experience, and we want to share it with you. You have to enter the space, not as a teacher, not as a savior. You are, you, I am one with a student who is 10, 15, 70. I know as little and as much. And so that, for me, that's a key. I don't know. I'd say ultimately, how do we serve you more than we serve ourselves in that? And I think even if sharing our story, maybe it is, it is that essence that connects us within that. And I think knowing that every person of the story that would stop your heart is something where we could just begin. And just that connection through that. Also, for us, the key in everything, whether you're building work, whether you're coalition building, humor, 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 is the only way to really talk about trauma yeah. in a way that is not unsafe for people. If I were to just talk about a rape story as a rape story, mm -hmm. and I know you're like, you're trying to make rape funny, no, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to humanize it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so humor doesn't just mean making people laugh. Human, for me, humor can be a levity. Mm -hmm. It's funny, but I think, especially since we are an ensemble of like women of color, we're not going to say censor. Our stories are not, our lives are not said. We are full of joy. We are full of overcoming. And how do we make that constant celebration of our lives is joy in finding that. You know, it's not, we cannot, yes, there are enough people making words about women of color that is very sad, but yeah. no, we're here saying, we're gonna take that back. Yes, that is our story, and that some of us can relate to that, but we are not sad. We are not constantly living in that oppression. Yeah. We are joy. One of our challenges actually has been, as our work has shifted artistically and found a, um, really a balance between dark and light, people are like, are you still in social justice theater if you're not just telling oppression stories? And that has been a real challenge with the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Working through it. Because oftentimes, that's what they mean when they say diversity. They want to hear the border story. They want to hear the immigrant story. Mm -hmm. They want to hear the woman of color race story. Mm -hmm. And do we talk about those things? Does it happen in real life? Absolutely. But we will never start from that place in our play. Yeah, no, we will not. Where do you start then? Like, if you don't start from that. Gossip. Gossip. It starts with gossip, it starts in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the checking is fundamental. The checking is where the shit goes. So, because we believe this, you are not alone in your story, right? Yeah. If it happened to me, it has happened to somebody else. And so as we're checking in, we're starting to see some trends, right? And then we get an idea. So with Gen Sex, every show starts differently. Uh, you know, there's no, I can't tell you there's one solution, but I can tell you it's the talking and the sharing. And if we start to see a trend, Okay, let's try to start writing about it. Everything starts with the writing and the talking. Or somebody can come in and say, oh my god, I saw this, let's write about it. And who knows, it can turn into a play. Yeah, it's not the show. Yes, and then yes. Um, um, I've been really interested in how you guys can talk about bridging, like between you know internal, ensemble, external. Yeah. So my question is, how do you blind contact, what is your first thing to craft the invitation, like that first email, phone call, or whatever, to a place you've never been before, or a certain community you've never been to, kind of how do you sell yourselves and, and talk about your work in a way, I, like how do you kind of, um, yeah, use that first contact to be useful? Um, I don't, there's no one answer to that, yeah. it's really strategic. I, just so everybody knows, most of our touring, is not from cold calls from sending out. Oh, yeah, it of course. Is, just, just to clear, you know what I mean? I just want to say, it is all about personal relationships. And let me tell you, professors at any school 
They are your lifeline, they are your lifeblood, respect them and invite them to your work all the time because they will then invite you out, right? But for me, I don't just want to go anywhere. I want to go where we're needed. So we contact people, if, if it is a cold call, maybe we saw that this school had some kind of LGBT crisis moment. Then I might cold call them and say, hey, we do this work around healing. Would you like us to come to your space? But we don't go anywhere that we haven't researched, that we haven't figured out. Can we learn something from you and can we give something? I love what you just said about we don't stop there. We don't stop at the rape. And I find it really problematic when we are doing work about historical justice mm -hmm. and how do we not perpetuate the violence yeah. mm -hmm. but to investigate it and then how we sort of like build the structure to move beyond it. Yeah. So I'd love for you to talk about content and form-wise how you address those issues in your work. Did you hear that, Ariel? Did you hear that question? Uh, no. I feel, like <laughs> I feel like she's like the girl to answer that question. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, I can hear you better now. Okay, so the question that I have, are you hearing me better and better now? <laughs> the question that I have is, um, I'm really excited um, by what was your name? Oh, Elizabeth had said, we do not stop at the rate and that we right. go beyond that. And I'm, I'm very, I'm concerned about when we look at historical injustice, it's very necessary to do that. But that I'm also, I also want to look at how we perpetuate the violence and how important it is when we're doing work like this to not do that and to figure out the structures of form and content in which we move beyond that. So I'm asking about how you do that in your work. Right. Um. I was thinking you could talk about bits of tea. Oh, yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> so, um, so we did this piece, Bits of Teeth, um, that was um, an outgrowth um, of a piece called 40 Years Ago. Um, and it, the, the piece 40 Years Ago, it looked, about, it looked, at, um, it looked at what is um, perpetrated against um, women of color now. Um, and what it will look like, what it might look like, envisioning for the future what it might look like um, for us to kind of get free from that. Um, and I think that in Bits of Teeth, there was kind of this reckoning moment of like, but we aren't, right? And so there's this sense of not wanting to perpetuate, not wanting to um, reiterate um, the trauma that we've already been through. But there's also this way in which I think that um, in so doing, we can kind of silence the traumas that we're, we are actually living in. Um, we can kind of silence um, um, the, the realities of, of, of the depths of that oppression. Um, and so how do you move that forward? How does anger become a generative place? Um, how does anger become a space of creation? Um, I think that there's um, that 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 anger actually has has transformative properties, um, and I think that um, in, in moments when when we of color, we women of color, have been silenced, um, um, the opportunity to kind of push that forward is um, it's transformative. It it, it can um, it can change spaces in as much as. Um, um, and as much as we are also afraid of them kind of keeping us stuck in moments. And I think that um, what it really comes out of is um, this kind of tension we had with 40 years ago, which was that, um, that in the end, there was this hope that there would be um, other people who would stand in the gap, um, that there might be men um, that might stand in the gap, that there might be other allies who might stand in the gap of us getting free. Um, and, and, and so this piece, um, Bits of Teeth, kind of looks more so at women of color as subjects in their own freedom. And so how do we take our narratives of oppression and move them through that into imagining how we're going to get ourselves free? Yeah. That's a real theory, beautiful, thank you for saying that. And then in the practical terms, theatrically, 
it is also what is the story you're telling before or after that moment. And so in the piece she's talking about, bits of teeth, it's the height of anger, it's the height of trauma of our play, and what's in, and it's loud, and I, I almost want to play the video of it. What's immediately followed is moments of silence and a love of two people falling in love with respect. So it's also about theatrically, how do you get, how do you move past that moment, and then the piece after that beautiful love story is elation and then trauma again. And so like it's also what are you putting before and what are you putting after? And that's why the positioning of scenes is so important because depending on the order, I could be telling a very different story. Um, so we have very little time left, 17 minutes left. So um, I would love to keep talking, but <laughs> I, if everybody can pull out a sheet and anybody who doesn't have one wants one, do we have anyone? Okay. Um, so this is just a little takeaway for you guys. If I wanted you to come away with some tools, I can give this to you. It's two different sheets of paper. Um, and the only thing, I want to give you guys five minutes right now to just look at step one and answer any of the questions that you would like. You can apply it to your own work as an independent artist. You can apply it to the work in any one ensemble you're doing. And this is kind of just our version of trying to walk you through the adaptability model that we were talking about, how do you, when faced with a challenge, how do you actually make it the opportunity of a lifetime that will break you out of a cycle? So, um, five minutes on the clock. Go ahead. First section. Huh? First section. Yeah, first section only. And while you do that, I'm just going to play this little video. Alex? Yes, ma'am. You gotta go. Yeah. Thanks, girl. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Love you. Talk to you soon. Thank you, thank you.
recognize um, there are just going to always be different levels of participation and instead of wanting more commitment from others how do you transition your own view of what is commitment from people what is involvement and try to meet everybody where they're at it's kind of like an AA room sometimes you don't share on your first meeting sometimes it takes many meetings yeah. <laughs> and that's what happens and so in that case when if I've been faced that so many times particularly with students and if it's a struggle to like pull it out of them the immediate thing I'll do, I'll immediately share myself or I'll put one of the girls who I know and be like, hey, tell your story, right? And it's an offering. Maybe, you don't, maybe you're not ready to give me an offering right now, but I'm gonna give you one. So that's just how you can take a challenge 
a moment of somebody not wanting to come into the space with you and, and give them a gift for them to take with them, right? And I think it really does go back to the fact that you can't, that everybody engages in their own time, right? And sometimes people feel like my voice is, you know, what I have to say, someone's already said it, so I don't need to put it out there. Mm -hmm. But it's really creating a safe space that empowers people to say, whatever sentence is going on in your head that you think someone said five minutes ago, say it. <laughs> because it's important from your voice and your empowerment too. Yeah. Um, so, so this is again, is a take home paper for you. And it was just us putting into like one sheet of paper how we have embraced some challenges. So we told you, we started touring, developing shows on the road to answer several challenges. That is how we turned an internal resource we already possessed into a solution for something else. But to even come to the place of solution, you have to actually identify what is the issue. Is the issue that the space wasn't made safe enough for that person to share? Um, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Could be that. Yeah. Could be that. Could be anything. Could, could be the yeah. climate. Could be the smell. Yeah. Yeah. So, so before we like stress about, oh, if I got this thousand dollars, if I got this hundred thousand dollar grant, my problems would be solved. Which is often where we approach things. Well, if I had the money, or if I had the space, or if I had a name yeah. director on this project, oftentimes these external solutions we're like we, we become obsessed with are not the solution. What 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 internal natural resources do you have? Mm -hmm. um, which is exactly where partnerships come into the fold, and they can like make and break you, right? So. Um, Anything else anybody wants to share? Let's walk you through. Step two is assess your natural resources. Who already has figured out the solution? I think sometimes, particularly as ensemble, we get there's so much work to do, we stop realizing there is not just a huge world of ensemble and device practice in the United States. We're like babies to this process in the United States. What other groups can you find that have been surviving 30, 40, 50 years more working together? They might have a solution. How might like a new app release and how they structured their technology around creating an app, how can that actually be a solution to you? So it's sometimes also thinking outside of like your artistic norm. Um, so these are just questions we'd love for you to think, like, think about as you're like challenging. We think the next step is dreaming, right? Like, but dreaming within the context of what you've already assessed. And so we have some prompts here that might like lead you through that process. Like we're basically strategic planning every day of our lives. Like it's a constant strategic plan. A question that has helped us a lot is if I change this one thing, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Going back to your question mark, if I changed who went on tour mm -hmm. and who stayed home, what would that impact me? If I change from Latina theater company to women of color, what would that be, right? And then, Planning, we often try to like make these master huge plans. So uh, just a toolkit we use, and because you're always exchanging between the I and the we, in the next four weeks, I can. Write that down. What can you do in the next four weeks for yourself based on any challenge? In the next eight weeks, I will. And in the next six months, we will have because of the work that everybody has done individually. And in one year, we will be doing. We never like to think of anything as an end point. It is just fodder for the next thing. And then, will you two read this last quote and we'll read it? On an island not so far from here, the local people became very annoyed at the pesky monkeys who lived in the trees surrounding their village and wrecked havoc on their orderly garden. A clever village elder created a small bamboo cage and placed a banana inside it, then hung it on the edge of his property. Late that afternoon, a monkey reached in and grabbed a banana. When he tried to pull it out between the narrow ribs of the cage, his hand was stuck. All he had to do was get, to get free was to release the banana and slide his little hand out. But that evening, when the elder came to check the trap, the monkey was hanging on it, still clutching that banana, even though it meant the loss of his own freedom. Many of us are just like that monkey. We grasp onto something that tantalizes us. And even when we realize that to be free, we have to let go, we hold on to none, we hold on nonetheless. One of the things that most commonly trap us is the habitual pattern of our own thinking, the limiting stories we tell ourselves about who we are and what our capacities are. This is an excerpt from Collaborative Intelligence by Don Markova and Angie Arthur. Mm -hmm. 
this book has changed my life. I really encourage you, if you work in ensemble, to get it, to read it. It has amazing exercises and practices. And um, so, if y'all want to stand up, um, just reflecting on what we just heard about how we sometimes, through are holding on to something that we've inherited or we have come up with, how are we preventing our own freedom? We really like to think, come, join circle, come, join circle, come, come, come. Um, at the end of the day, we have to remember the artist has the power. We relinquish the power way too often when we think we don't have enough money or the way to do something. A spiritual guide once told us, if you wait to go to the moon until you're ready, somebody else will colonize that planet. Mm -hmm. So, uh -huh. you know what I mean? So it's this idea. What can you let go to find freedom? Maybe it's the idea that you have to have a season in a traditional sense, like a regional theater, and that doesn't work for your form and how you create work. Whatever it is, I would love for us to just breathe together, so take a breath in, and exhale whatever it is keeping me from letting go. Let's breathe in again together. I want to thank you guys so much for being here with us for 90 minutes. Um, we want to think that we're a resource in sharing our own failures and our own struggles and our own successes. Um, and we're around online all the time. Um, we'll be launching a YouTube channel to kind of talk about the journey um, in a much more direct way. And so hopefully you'll join us in that. And I, I just would love to hear your thoughts anytime you want to share them with us online. Anything else, anybody wants to share, shout out, put into the space, love, 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 justice, peace, anything? <laughs> um, I'm thankful to be in this room filled with all this mind that have a diversity and a land of abundance of thoughts. And I'm just very thoughtful about this. And it's a, I'm going to take home a lot of thoughts that I'm going to be reflecting and hopefully putting into free street and also into my own personal artist journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you everybody, it was so great to have you here. Thank you so much.